Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Can you all hear me? Yes? Right. Okay, yes. a, very warm, yeah, a very warm welcome to all of you to join us in the first Tux Far East Symposium. Okay, uh, I'm Kelvin Boon, an upper GI surgeon from Malaysia, and I'm also the Tux Far East coordinator. With me today, we have uh, Mr. Hans Mahendran, also an upper GI surgeon from Malaysia. Uh, Mr. Hans can wave to our club. <laughs> he is also the chairman of the training committee for Malaysia Upper GI Surgery Trade uh, Society. Okay, um, it's our great honor today to have all of you here in this uh, wonderful symposium. And we are going to talk about the current practice in the surgical approach of esophageal cancer. So um, we are your host today. And um, just some housekeeping rules before um, we proceed. Number one, all of you are muted. Okay, so if you have any questions along the way, feel free to use the chat box function, put in your questions there, and we shall discuss them during the Q&A session towards the end. Number two, this symposium is recorded for internal use and also for future replay. As such, your participation uh, actually serve as a consent for us to record you in the video. So without further ado, let us, uh, I probably will invite Mr. Hans um, to kickstart the um, exciting event of tonight. Mr. Hans? Sorry, I got to unmute you, right? Okay, just give me a minute. Uh, okay, you got it? All right. Oh, thank you, Kelvin. I thought you didn't want me to speak today. Anyway, <laughs> welcome everyone. Uh, today, it gives me great pleasure to call upon uh, Professor Kamal Mahawa, who is a consultant general bariatric surgeon at the Sunderland Royal Hospital in the northeast of England, and is a visiting professor at the University of Sunderland. Professor Kamal is an associate editor for the Journal of Obesity Surgery, Annals of Royal College of Surgeons of England, and Clinical Obesity. He also sits on the editorial board of uh, Surgery for Obesity and Related Diseases, SOARD, SORD. Professor Kamal is a council member of the Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland and is a council member of the British Obesity and Metabolic Society, uh, BOMSS. Many among you have been asking me what is TUGS all about, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Prof Kamal himself, who is the chief coordinator of TUGS, a society that has grown to a, grown to a membership of more than 1,400, 1,500 members across the world. And he will tell us more about it in his welcome address. Professor Kamal. So, um, first of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Mahendran, for such a uh, generous introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Woon, for organizing uh, this wonderful symposium. Um, I'll come to the vision behind tags in a second. But before that, I think we may have a technical hitch there. The participant number is, is not increasing above 100. And I just wonder if our Zoom platform is, is playing some games there. I think we were licensed for up to 500 members. So I may have to check it up uh, as soon as I've given the welcome address, so I'll have to log off for a bit, little bit. Um, but even that, in that case, so we're, we're recording it and I'm hoping that those who are disappointed today and can't join will be able to join us later. The vision behind TUGS, uh, um, and it's not just uh, you know, my own organization, it is, it is owned by 1500 uh, colleagues from around the world and, and dozens of coordinators who are working behind it, is that we wanted to create a platform for all of upper GI surgery where we can work together, create together, learn together, and also do research and academic work together. If you see the colorectal surgeons uh, who are not far from us uh, in terms of speciality, they have got this sort of international collaborative culture already uh, in place. And I think much credit goes to Professor Julio Mayol from Spain and, and, and Stephen Wexner from USA and many, many other colleagues you know, from, from UK, Richard Brady, Neil Smart. They've been leading that movement. So I have to say we were inspired by them and, and, and we were thinking, why can't we do a similar thing for all of upper GI? Yes, we are working in our own niche areas like bariatric and cancer surgery, which takes prominent time, but equally the complexity of our, our discipline should be the reason for us to work more together and not less. 
And we spotted that there was no platform for all of upper GI surgeons globally. And that was the vision behind Tex. And that is probably the reason why it has been so successful. So without any further ado, um, we are really honored to have an esteemed panel of, of really, really uh, stalwarts in, in the field uh, from Asia. I think we should listen to them, not, not me. And as I said, I need to work out and find out what, why is the participant number capped at 100. I think there's a problem with the Zoom account there, but the apology is mine. So over to you, Hans, over to you, Kelvin. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Mahawa. Thank you for the warm address and um, thank you for creating such a good international platform for all of us to come together. And um, it's really a good opportunity for us to do networking here among the upper GI surgeons. Okay, uh, without further ado, my great honor to introduce the first speaker, my dear mentor from um, Chongsan Hospital, Futan University, Professor Li Jie Tan. Um, Professor Tan is the chief of thoracic surgery from Chongsan Hospital, um, which is one of the um, top uh, tertiary center in um, China. Um, besides holding multiple in, important positions in uh, China Thoracic and Esophageal Disease Society, he is also the uh, fellow of American College of Surgeons, as well as the member of AATS. Uh, he has vast experience in the, especially in minimally invasive esophagectomy, and he has numerous publications in index journals. Uh, let us welcome Prof Tan and Prof Tan, the screen is yours. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, for your introduction. Uh, first, let me share my screen. Is that okay? Yes, that's good. Thank yeah, you. Uh, yeah, it's my great honor to uh, join this uh, five step giant meeting for the soft gel surgery. As you know, uh, in China, a little bit different from uh, Malaysia or uh, UK or Hong Kong, a soft gel surgery is belongs to the work of thoracic surgeons. So, uh, so that's a little uh, difference between all the uh, divisions of surgery to deal with this disease. For thoracic surgeon, we are familiar with the uh, anatomy of the thorax, uh, but we are not good at uh, maybe sometimes the uh, mobilization of the uh, stomach or the colon for the colon interposition, but we uh, learn lots from uh, our GI surgeons to do uh, these things by ourselves. So today's topic is the uh, minimally invasive esophagectomy for esophageal cancer, the way forward. So uh, this is the statistics in China about this disease. Uh, China is a huge country and with a huge amount of patients with esophageal cancer, it's a count and maybe uh, more than five, uh, more than 50% of the world's newly diagnosed cases. And also the uh, half of the world death of the world from this disease is from China. So esophageal cancer, especially uh, squamous cell carcinoma is the most uh, tough cancer in China for all the uh, uh, physicians and the government. And uh, surgery is the mainstay of the management of esophageal cancer. As we know, for early stage, like uh, T1A is now uh, always by the uh, endoscopist for the uh, mucosa resection. But for uh, T1B or T2 and zero patients, they go straight forward for surgery. Now we have minimally invasive or robotic assistant minimally invasive esophagectomy or uh, from Japan, and uh, now uh, some surgeons from China, they also try to do a transmediastinal uh, esophagectomy by the uh, endoscope assistant. And uh, another way for the uh, locally advanced disease of esophageal cancer, we always do surgery after induction therapy, like a new adjuvant chemo chemotherapy or new adjuvant chemoradiation especially after the very good results from the cross trial. More and more Chinese surgeons now do a multimodality uh, treatment for these cancers. And also in, our, in my hospital, we always do minimally invasive esophagectomy, even for the patient 
uh, after induction or even for these after uh, radical uh, chemoradiation for the uh, like uh, salvage resection. So in the past, let me just uh, review the history of the uh, technical evolution of MIE. The first uh, MIE was established in 19, 1992 by Dr. Kusheri. In, I think he's from Edinburgh. And uh, one year later in end of surgery, Dr. Bam from German published their experience of endodissection of the thoracic esophagus by the uh, transhiatal subjectomy. And uh, the most famous surgeon in this field is Dr. James Luktich from uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, he do a lot of work uh, on MIE, but both, both in a uh, three stage or Ivan Lewis uh, minimally invasive subjectomy and uh, published lots of papers in this field. And one surgeon from uh, India, Dr. Pananavelu, he published his experience of 130 MIEs in prime position, which was published in Journal of American College of Surgeons. And I think his procedure influenced the most of Chinese surgeons. So nowadays in China, most uh, surgeons choose the uh, prime position or semi prime I, I, I think the same in Taiwan, in uh, Japan, or Korea. Uh, more and more surgeons use this prone positioning to do a mobilization in the thoracic stage. So there, there are two famous clinical trials in the past of this field. One is a time which compared MIE with open procedure from uh, Netherlands. And another is a mirror trial from uh, French. It's a hybrid MIE versus open procedure. We can see from the time uh, trial, MIE improved uh, less pulmonary infections and short hospital stay and better quality of life after surgery. And uh, the uh, clinical trial from France just a uh, hybrid, they use the uh, laparoscopic procedure to mobilization of the stomach and with the open thoracotomy. Uh, compared with a thoracotomy, combined laparotomy. And even the laparoscopic state, they found less major post operative complications in the hybrid MIE groups. And for the uh, disease-free survival and the overall survival, and they have some uh, advantages compared with the open procedure. So that's amazing. Because this is the uh, evidence from our own practice. We have a propensity score matching study in our uh, division, and we compared um, uh, 444 in each group and found that the uh, minimally invasive group had a short operating, operative duration, less blood loss and lower major comorbidities and the short post-operative hospital stay compared with the open. And uh, our group first reported the MIE procedure use a German experience, the German procedure use a special metastinoscopic a subject to me in, two, in 1994. And uh, then in the uh, 2000, we uh, you become our thoracoscopic combined with laparoscopic minimally invasive procedure. And uh, we use the uh, prong or semi prong position can uh, take pl in place of the traditional decubitus position. And uh, we also do some uh, analysis. This is our retrospective study compared the prom position with decubitus position. And we found there is some uh, uh, advantages in prom position, even for less anastomic leakage in the prom position group. And uh, we, uh, we also do some uh, uh, prospective uh, research since this compared with prompt position to uh, 
the equipment is positioned and from the uh, prospect of the surgeon's ergonomics and the fund, the uh, ergonomics is better in prompt position than that in the, uh, the cubitus position. And also we refine the ventilation strategy, uh, strategy in the anesthesia uh, procedure in, in the MIE. We found a lower tidal volume is better, is better for the oxygenation and uh, can achieve less pulmonary complications after MIE. And the most important thing in minimal in subjectomy is how to uh, dissection the uh, lymph node. This is uh, uh, data from China about the metastasis rate from the uh, esophageal cancer of the lymph node. We can see the most frequent location is the uh, bilateral laryngeal recurrent nerve field. So it's important to clean these loads between, uh, during MIE. So we uh, have uh, do some refinements of our technique to do a radical uh, dissection of these uh, lymph nodes. I think uh, Yin Kai will introduce his experience, especially in this field about the lymph node dissection. So I think the uh, concept of the lymph node dissection is similar now in the uh, East Asia group. Uh, we are always do bilateral laryngeal recurrent nerve lymph node dissection in the uh, MIE as we do in the open procedure and always use the, uh, the sharp dissection along the recurrent nerve to less trauma of the nerve and to decrease the uh, complication like the hoarseness or aspiration after the surgery. So I think compared with the open procedure, the uh, refinement in MIE achieve better exposure for operation and maybe have some advantages in no dissection, except for the uh, very large uh, bulky lymph node. It's not easy to do in the scope. And uh, let's move to the uh, construction after minimally invasive esophagectomy. Now we always use this uh, narrow uh, gas tube as the uh, conduit after for the reconstruction. And we found the narrow is better than the wide one uh, in the uh, procedure. It's easy to pour up with less leakage and with good uh, gastric emptying and uh, quality of life and less reflux. Uh, this is a procedure from Beijing. One Chinese group, Dr. Li Ying, they use their technique of uh, uh, three layers hand sewing in the neck and with the, some uh, anti-reflux procedure to decrease this uh, complication after surgery with a pretty lower leakage rate and a lower reflux after the surgery. And they even get the, let the patient to oral intake one day after the surgery. And uh, we also do uh, some uh, Ivan Lewis procedure for uh, each junction tumor or for the uh, lower, sometimes for the lower esophageal uh, cancer in the distal part of the, just close to the cardiac. And uh, we try several uh, techniques like the oval, like the uh, purse string method, but now we use the uh, modified overlap use the linear stapler to do the uh, anesmosis. We found it easy and safe. And uh, we always, uh, first we make anesmosis, then we uh, transect the esoph esophagus. We found it's easy to do and uh, it's uh, reproducible. With, le with a short uh, learning curve. Uh, in most cases, intrathoracic anesmosis is uh, more difficult, more complex than cervical anesmosis. 
So sometimes it's not easy to do a uh, totally end uh, scope and uh, we modify this uh, technique and uh, we found the uh, back wall of the mesmosis is very uh, fixed. And we use the uh, like uh, easy uh, 60 to do the anesmosis to let the uh, the diameter of the anesmosis is wide. And we can check the uh, mucosa of the anesmosis site. And uh, we uh, we can see clearly it's it's good. Then we close the uh, or the uh, orifice use the uh, hand sewing method, or sometimes we also use a stapler to close, and we found that it's better to use the, uh, use the uh, hand sewing to close this orifice. And at present, uh, there are more new techniques in the MIE field, like uh, uh, the uh, robotic assistant, uh, we have two clinical trials, the robot trial from Europe or uh, the Remy trial from China, which was led by the, uh, my best friend, Dr. Lee from Shanghai Chester Hospital. And we also have some uh, new technique like transmedia Steinem single pot minimally invasive ethotectomy. And also we tried uh, some cases after induction therapy or even salvage resection. So this is the uh, robotic, the Remy trial from uh, China. And uh, we have 10 centers from China to uh, do this trial and uh, included 362 patients with half, nearly half to the robotic group and another half to the uh, MIE group. And the initial result was uh, very good, and uh, the uh, clinical result is almost the same with small lymph nodes harvested from the left pharyngeal recurrent nerve. As more and more robotic is now equipped in the uh, Chinese hospital, uh, more surgeons try the robotic assistant subjectomy in this field. So another is a mediastinoscope assessment is subjectomy. It's uh, first reported, the technique is reported from uh, Kyoto by Dr. Fujiwara in 2015. And some Chinese surgeons try this uh, method. And they found the operation time is less and the harvest node is similar to the uh, thoracoscopic procedure and uh, less blood loss and uh, they have the, the initial results show the same oncological outcomes in early stage esophageal cancer from the mediastinal group. And uh, we are uh, even uh, modify this technique. We uh, try uh, some cases uh, from last year, use the uh, gastroscope, uh, to insert through the mediastinum to do the uh, esoph esophageal mobilization. The, uh, we only choose the very early cases, but with uh, diffused mucosa disease, cause in China, most uh, patients with, uh, with the uh, early stage, they have a diffused uh, mucosa disease. So the, like uh, ESD or uh, the technique the endoscopics afraid of resect too much mucosa and causing a very uh, severe strip after, after mucosa resection. So they always uh, let these patients to find uh, the surgical resection. Yeah, but if the, there is lymph node, there is no lymph node metastasis, I think uh, it's, it's enough to just resect the uh, esophagus. So we try in uh, very limited cases to use the uh, hyper knife. I think it's uh, the, the 
advantage is this technique is very safe because the hyper knife they has it has a very little uh, thermal damage to the adjacent structure like the uh, the trachea, like the nerve, or the uh, aorta, or the other structures surrounding the esophagus. And uh, we just try in eight cases and with no uh, complications. Uh, and uh, so this is, uh, we can see the uh, abdominal cavity from the uh, esophagus, from the diaphragm. And uh, we also can biopsy the lymph node. Uh, maybe I think this uh, method may be beneficial in some special cases, uh, cause the, uh, it's easy to biopsy all the lymph node uh, use the uh, flexible scope. Even it's easy, uh, it's more easier than the uh, rigid scope. And we can see this is the spine, the uh, pericardium and the aorta, and this is the tracheal. And uh, even we can see uh, clearly the recurrent nerve under the scope. So we can also do the uh, link node the biopsy from the recurrent nerve. The bilateral recurrent nerve we can see under the vision of the scope. So uh, at the end of my presentation, I tried to uh, introduce we are, our results from MIE after induction therapy. We just published our clinical results uh, in JAMA surgery and uh, find no difference in the post-operative complications between the group of chemo alone or chemo radiation for the locally advanced esophageal cancer. And I, as I mentioned before, some Chinese surgeons, they try to a uh, very early oral feeding after MIE. They even let the patient have oral intake the one day after the surgery. And their results seem uh, very, very good. Yeah, but most surgeons, they don't want to try because they are afraid of the risk of uh, leakage for such early uh, oral intake. So the summary is MIE is pro proved with better recovery and uh, similar oncological results compared with the uh, traditional open procedure. And uh, new techniques such as robotic assistant or transmediastinal esophagectomy subject deserve to try, but need more evidence for these new techniques. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Prof Tan, for the um, excellent presentation on uh, MIE. I, I have to agree totally with uh, what Prof Tan said because I spent nine months there with him two years ago and uh, I, I'm the eyewitness of what he is doing and I'm really amazed with the volume and the techniques of uh, MIE that I've learned it from Shanghai. So uh, I will pass the mic to Mr Hans to introduce our second speaker. There you go, Mr Hans. Again, you are muted. Sorry. Okay. All right, there you go. So I'm starting and... to think that Dr. Kelvin doesn't like me. Anyway, <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Professor Simon Law. He currently is the Chung Kung Hai Professor of Gastrointestinal Surgery and Chief of the Division of Esophageal and Upper GI Surgery at the University of Hong Kong. Professor Simon Law is a council member of the College of Surgeons of Hong Kong and past president of the Hong Kong Society of Upper Gastrointestinal Surgeons. He has served as a chairman of the General Surgery Board and chief examiner of the Joint Fellowship Examinations of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and the College of Surgeons of Hong Kong. He currently serves as an executive council member of the International Society of Digestive Surgery, ISDE, and is also currently the vice president. His career has revolved around surgery and research for benign and malignant pathologies of the upper GI uh, tract and is definitely a leader in this field. We welcome Professor Simon Law to talk to us about cardioesophageal junction tumors and choosing the right surgery. Professor Simon. 
Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Hans, for your kind introduction. I'll just share my slide. Can you see my slide? Yep, nice and clear. Okay, all right. <clears throat> I'm, <clears throat> I'm given the task to talk about um, a subject which is quite uh, dear to my heart and esophageal gastric junction cancer. Uh, I know TUX is a very uh, international organization. I think this is very appropriate uh, topic uh, because this is where East uh, meets West and there's a lot of controversies uh, with this area. Now let's just talk about what we what the subject matter is today. Uh, we are talking about EGJ junction tumor. And as you know, there is this CVID classification and perhaps uh, less use is a Nishi classification in Japan. Now, both actually are pretty similar. So the CVET uh, classification, I guess, is uh, pretty popular. It refers to adenocarcinoma located around the uh, gastroesophageal junction at a position five centimeter proximal and five centimeter distal to the anatomical gastroesophageal junction, and is divided into type one, type two, and type threes. Now, I just have to uh, remind uh, everyone that uh, the CVET classification refers to the epicenter of the tumor. So if the cancer lies within, say, one centimeter proximal and two centimeter distal to the anatomical gastroesophageal junction, it would be classified as a type two cancer. Now, the, there are a lot of uh, drawbacks to the system. Of course, uh, referring to the epicenter doesn't take into account the proximal and the distal extent of the tumor. So you could have a 10 centimeter tumor centered on the GE junction, it's a type two. You can also have a two centimeter tiny little cancer centered on a GE junction. It's also a type two, and obviously the treatment will be very different. Unfortunately, the uh, vocabulary of CVID classification has uh, been so popular, but I think that one has to keep this in mind before we want to discuss uh, this particular subject. For the Nishi classification, it's mostly used in Japan. Uh, basically, it's roughly the same thing, but it refers to a more limited area, two centimeter proximal and two centimeter distal to the gastroesophageal junction, and is classified as whether it is uh, esophageal predominant, gastric predominant, or whether it's uh, basically the same. So <clears throat> now when we talk about surgery of EGJ junction tumors, what are our aims? Uh, these are the aims. Uh, we want to achieve negative margins, both approximately distally as well as circumferentially. We want to do adequate but appropriate lymph node dissection, uh, or keeping in mind that we have to be safe, uh, taking into account technical considerations and tailored for the risk analysis of the individual patients. And of course, uh, the reconstruction dictates a lot uh, about the postoperative the quality of life. Now, classically or traditionally, these are the um, options that we have, we mostly talk about. Um, now, for esophageal cancer, so so-called a type 1 cancer, there is perhaps little controversy. Most uh, surgeons would say, well, this, because of the extent of involvement of the esophagus, you need a esophagectomy. For type 3 cancers, um, again, the controversy is less. Most uh, surgeons would say you would do a extended total gastrectomy with a little bit of resection of the distal esophagus. Now for the type two cancers is most controversial. Uh, there are surgeons who would do a subjectomy and there are also equally number of surgeons who would like to do extended to total gastrectomy. Now, how we choose one over the other. This was a questionnaire study a few years ago uh, <clears throat> launched <coughs> by various societies uh, dealing with upper GI uh, pathologies in the world and the uh, members were asked uh, what sort of surgery are they preferring for this type of cancer. Now, it's very interesting if you look at here on the left-hand side by geography, in Asia, it is predominantly extended gastrectomy, while if you go to, say, Europe and North America, a subjectomy and extended gastrectomy is sort of uh, equal in numbers. If you look at the type of surgeons, uh, this is perhaps not uh, unexpected, for esophageal surgeons, of course, they do esophagectomy. For uh, gastric surgeons, they do gastrectomies. Uh, but for a, a hybrid surgeons like myself, esophageal and gastric surgeon or, or GI surgeon, uh, we will tend to do both. 
So what you do, uh, it seems that it depends on your training. So uh, Li Ji, for instance, he's a thoracic surgeon. So when he comes across a cardiac cancer, he might prefer to do it uh, through the chest. While if you are a gastric surgeon, uh, then maybe you like to do it in the abdomen. I think the predominance of Asian surgeons who would like to do a gastrectomy uh, is because of two reasons. Firstly, they are probably more gastric surgeons than esophageal surgeons in Asia. And secondly, there are more gastric cancers in Asia and hence explaining the uh, preference. Now, but when you look at the actual um, uh, level one evidence, uh, there aren't really that many. Uh, this was one trial published uh, some years ago now, but it's the only really large trial. Japanese trial looking at EGJ junction tumors, supposed to be type two and type threes, but you have to qualify it by a less than three centimeter or equal esophageal invasion, only three centimeter. So when you have a longer esophageal invasion, uh, that would not uh, be qualified for this trial. Patients are then randomized to undergo a transabdominal total gastrectomy, D2 gastrectomy. And in fact, at that time, they were very aggressive. They were even uh, doing upper parotic dissection. That is, uh, was compared to another group who did a left thoracoabdominal uh, resection with the same type of uh, resection, but of course, with a better exposure in the lower part of the chest, uh, they could do a lower mediastinal dissection much better compared to the transabdominal group. Now, the trial was uh, hypothesized um, in that 30% of T2 to T4 EGJ tumors with one centimeter more invasion in the lower esophagus should have mediastinal lymph nodes. And therefore, by doing a left thoracal abdominal incision, you would be able to do a more thorough lower mediastinal dissection and hence a better survival. Now, it's not surprising that if you do a left thoracal abdominal incision on the right-hand side column, you are likely to have more complications because of the thoracotomy involved. So mostly it is because of a pneumonia and the ventilatory use um, that uh, led to a higher morbidity uh, with the left thoracal abdominal approach, uh, although the operation mortality was the same. The long-term uh, follow-up uh, results of this trial, up to 10-year follow-up, show no significant difference uh, between the two approaches. So the authors concluded that therefore a transiatal resection from the abdomen is adequate for tumors of this kind. Now, this trial was a little bit uh, criticized in a way. Firstly, uh, it was mainly run by gastric surgeons. So the esophageal surgeon in Japan, they say, well, you know, the gastric surgeons, they don't know how to do a lower mediastinal lymph node dissection, hence the results. Secondly, the original hypothesis of 30% of nodal metastases in the lower mediastinum, in fact, when they did the resection, that was uh, overestimated. They only found about 10% of patients would have a lower mediastinal lymph node uh, um, um, spread. So you could argue that sample size calculation was uh, well, a little bit skewed. And thirdly, when you compare the two groups, there was some imbalance in the patient uh, characteristics as well. So although this was a very influential trial, uh, not everyone uh, believed in uh, the uh, conclusion the, from this particular trial, uh, but this is basically what we have as far as randomized controlled trial is concerned. Now, importantly, this was a very important paper, I think published a couple of years ago, again from Japan. Uh, it was a joint study from the Japanese Esophageal Society as well as the uh, Japanese Gastric Cancer Association. Now, what is important was that this trial was a prospective study. So everybody agreed on a uh, of, uh, surgical strategy. And the idea is to do lymph node mapping and to see where the lymph nodes are from EGJ junction tumors. So there are nearly 400 patients. Now the uh, strategy was that if you have an adenocarcinoma which has less than three centimeter invasion in the esophagus, surgeons would be uh, mostly do a transidal approach without doing a thoracotomy. If you have a longer invasion, of course they would do then a subjectomy. Now it turns out that the median tumor size in the study was 4.6 centimeter 
The median esophageal involvement was only two centimeter, but that's expected um, because for esophageal adenocarcinoma in Asia, we really do not see that many Barrett's long segment esophagus. 30% neoadjuvant uh, therapy for the adenocarcinomas. Now to cut a long story short, they categorize the lymph node metastases into three categories. Category one are the lymph nodes which are frequently involved and so should be resected if you want to do this type of surgery. Category two stations are the intermediate ones somewhere between five to 10%. And the category three are the ones uh, with uh, infrequent lymph node metastases less than 5%. So, well, maybe these should be optional. Now the paper is of course complicated, lots of numbers, uh, but to just to jump to the conclusion. So the idea is that if you have a T2 to T4 adenoma or SCCs, although mostly we talk about adenos when we talk about EGJ junction tumors, and if you have more than four centimeter involvement of the esophagus, basically these are treated as esophageal cancer. So you should do a subjectomy with lymph node dissection, even in the superior mediastinum, including the recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes. But if you have a limited esophageal involvement, say less than two centimeter, basically you can do everything in the abdomen. And these are the lymph node stations that you should resect. The ones in between the two to four centimeter, then you should do the abdominal lymph node dissection but at the same time, there are some lower mediastinal lymph nodes that you should remove. So this was the conclusion. And of course, um, the more esophageal involvement, the more you will need a transthoracic approach. And the less the esophageal involvement, you can probably do it through the abdomen. Of course, there are some other considerations which we will consider later on. Now, it is also important to note that these are generally small tumors. And the authors uh, conclude that have also found that if you have a tumor which is fairly large, say less, uh, more than six centimeter, then the chance of nodal metastases to the distal part of the stomach is significant. And therefore you would have to remove the distal stomach as well. That is a total gastrectomy. If you look carefully at these uh, numbers for the limited involvement, stay, say station five and station six, they do not come into it because for a small EGG junction tumors, lymph node metastases to the distal part of the stomach seems insignificant. And so there is a argument of doing a proximal gastrectomy, which I will talk about uh, later on. So when you have to decide what to do, um, now that was in theory, all right, you know where the lymph nodes are and therefore that's what you should do. But in practice, there may be some difficulties. Now, I listed some of the factors that I think are important. You know, for example, if you have an early tumor, of course, it's easier to do a transabdominal approach. If you have an advanced tumors, then, of course, uh, with more esophageal involvement, you would need a transthoracic approach. The histology matter, or right, the poorly adhesive type, they tend to spread some mucosal, so you need more margins. Um, the healthy esophageal remnant, all right, so after the resection, if you do it from the abdomen, you're going to be close to the tumor. And uh, often for obstructive tumors, the subtural remnant may be retamatous. Uh, these days with new adjuvant therapy, even chemoradiation therapy, there are subtural remnants that you're going to use for anastomosis is going to be irradiated. So it may be better to go up into the chest to gain a uh, longer margin and a more healthy margin. Elderly patients, of course, you don't want to do a chest. Exposure of the hiatus to in Asia, Probably most of the time we're okay. We have got young patients. Um, we have got thin patients, uh, but you know, in the UK, in the States, when they're very large patients, exposures at the hiatus may be difficult and it, often it may be easier to do the anastomosis in the chest. Do you actually suspect mediastinal lymph nodes? You know, despite the lymph node mapping, there may be patients with the occasional mediastinal lymph nodes that are uh, seem to be too far away, but then it's suspicious you would need to have a transthoracic approach and the reconstruction methods, of course. So in addition to um, what you have uh, in theory, there are lots of practical considerations of uh, what sort of uh, surgery you want to do. So the choice of procedure, therefore, for a type 1 cancer, or shall I say the ones with long esophageal involvement, there is little controversy, you would do a subjectomy. Well, but then there's still a choice whether you want to do an intrathoracic anastomosis 
or whether you want to do a McEwen's operation with a neck anastomosis. I think that partly depends on the lymph node dissection you plan to do and also whether your esophageal remnant, having resected the proximal stomach, is healthy and long enough to reach the neck. Now, but mostly we talk about type 2 and type 3 cancers when we mention EGJ junction tumors in Asia. Now, so these patients have limited esophageal involvement, as I've shown you. Again, there is a choice of esophagectomy. Traditionally, we do total gastrectomy. But nowadays, with that data coming out showing the, uh, um, the uh, paucity of uh, lymph node metastases to the distal part of the stomach for small tumors, so definitely proximal gastrectomy is an option. And here you have a lot of choice for reconstruction. So a double tract, a double flap, or a jejunal interposition are the three uh, commonly used uh, uh, reconstruction. Um, and the fourth one, of course, is to a direct esophageal gastrostomy. Now, firstly, to talk about total gastrectomy versus proximal gastrectomy, since total gastrectomy is traditionally what we do for cancers of the EGJ. Now, there is evidence uh, showed that a laparoscopic proximal gastrectomy with a double tract reconstruction appears to be superior in preventing vitamin B12 deficiencies compared to a total gastrectomy, weight seemed to be the same. This was one study. Uh, Major analysis again shows similar uh, findings, 11 studies of nearly a thousand patients showing again a decrease in hemoglobin in the long run is better with a proximal gastrectomy preserving the distal part of the stomach. Weight also in this particular study is also better in the uh, proximal gastrectomy group. So the Koreans are doing this trial, I'm sure you're aware of, the class five trial. Basically it's a randomized control trial comparing laparoscopic proximal gastrectomy versus the laparoscopic total gastrectomy for early gastric cancer of the EGJ. And so a total is as total, a double track uh, is reconstructed this way. The primary endpoint, in fact, interestingly, is a hemoglobin change. So just like I said, the vitamin B12 deficiency hemoglobin, and also there are some secondary endpoints as well shown here. Um, I don't think the final results are out yet. Uh, it would be quite interesting to, to know. So this is a double track reconstruction. So you can do it laparoscopically. This one, we do it open. As you could see, that's the jejunum, that's the gastro jejunostomy and the jejunal jejunostomy. The food does go double track. So this was a contrast study that we did postoperatively. That's the EGJ. And you see the contrast is coming through. Some is going through the jejunum. Some is actually going through the uh, right-hand side into the gastric remnant. And again, this uh, X-ray on your uh, left-hand corner, again, show the contrast going both through the gastric remnant as well as through the um, uh, jejunum. The other techniques is gaining popularity is the double flap technique, sometimes called the Kamikawa method. I think uh, uh, Liji just now talked about for a subjectomy, some surgeons are doing anti-reflux anastomosis, and that's precisely what it is. The idea is to create a tunnel raising serosal flaps, and then the duct the uh, esophageal um, esophagus into the stomach to do an esophageal gastrostomy, and then followed by uh, repairing the flaps. So this would act as an anti-reflux valve. The other um, Reconstruction that I mentioned would be a jejunal interposition. Now, I have to say that I don't have personal experience with this. Um, from what I uh, gather from colleagues, especially some uh, European surgeons who uh, uh, were proposing this idea, uh, is that this is actually not a simple operation to do. The jejunum is hard to make it work. Sometimes there are kinks. The motility of the jejunum sometimes is also rather unpredictable. And so patients might have reflux problems, they might have dysphagia. And I think generally uh, we would uh, refrain from doing this type of operation. So the difficulty of all these operations is how do you do the anastomosis? Safety, obtaining sufficient proximal margins, and of course the expertise that is available. So often you will need to mobilize quite a bit of the lower esophagus and do your anastomosis really high in the uh, lower mediastinum. This was a patient we did some years ago uh, when we were still doing mostly open using a circular stapler. 
uh, with uh, widely retracting hiatus into the esophageal gastrostomy high into the lower mediastinum. Nowadays, we do laparoscopically. So just to give you an idea of what we do, if we do esophagectomy or esophageal gastrectomy, uh, this is the way we do it in the chest. In fact, just like what Liji showed you, um, very similar uh, method. We, again, we try using the orthil before and so on. But nowadays, we seem to be settled on this linear stapler technique. So again, this is a side-to-side -side, uh, linear stapler esophageal gastrostomy. We close the common opening with another stapler. And then, oops, sorry. And then the uh, final bit, the uh, tip of the stomach, we often will resect as well. So there we are with the stomach and the esophagus in the back. Now for um, uh, abdominal, um, transabdominal uh, esophagectomy, this is what we do. So we firstly use a stapler. We deliberately do not transect through the whole esophagus, leaving a little bit behind, because once we've transected that, the whole thing will go back into low mediastinum. So we first put a stitch on the cross of the diaphragm to stop the thing from going up. And then we divide the rest of the esophagus. You see the esophageal stump going back into the mediastinum. This was a double track reconstruction. So this is a jejunum, again, using a linear stapler to do the anastomosis. And then because this hole will slip a little bit back into the hiatus, uh, we would tend to close it by hand sewn. So we divided the jejunal loop and then we closed the uh, esophageal jejunostomy opening with a uh, running uh, barb suture. And then followed by the gastro jejunostomy, again using the linear stapler, double stapling technique, first with uh, one firing and then closing the common hole with another linear stapler. And then finally the jejunal jejunostomy. So this is the double track with a three anastomosis and then again closing the common channel with a linear stapler. So we do it the total laparoscopically and then through a small wound we will retrieve the uh, specimen. Okay, so what are the effects of these different reconstruction techniques? So the, I think this is a nice meta-analysis showing the five different methods. So the left-hand side, A, is a, a jejunal interposition. The second one is a double track. The third one is a direct esophageal gastrostomy. D is a double flap with the anti-reflux procedure. And E is a jejunal pouch, which I think uh, there aren't many surgeons who are doing this. If you look at our esophagitis rate, um, clearly uh, the double track and the double flat techniques are better compared to the others. And I think these two techniques are pretty much uh, the same in terms of uh, anti-reflux uh, mechanism. So another review looking at the types of reconstruction, if you do a direct esophageal gastrostomy, of course you have uh, some stenosis uh, strictures. Uh, reflux esophagitis is definitely high if you do a double flap anti-reflux, then the reflux of vaginitis is only zero to eight percent. The double track technique again have a very good safety profile as well as reflux of vaginitis and strictures. And then the jejunal interposition and the pouch uh, again with uh, more complications. So I think if you look at there for the say four types of reconstructions after a limited EGJ resection with a proximal gastrectomy, uh, roughly this is a comparison. And I think to cut a long story short, my preference is really a double tract. Um, it is uh, very good in anti-reflux and also it is relatively simple. I think the double flap techniques in fact is a very good technique, but just technically it is really quite typical and time consuming. And of course, if you're expert surgeons, I think the double flap is also a very good uh, option. So I think to summarize, I think surgical strategy for EGJ junction tumor is a balance of safety oncological clearance. Uh, we've mentioned quite a bit about that, but then of course the quality of life considerations are important. When oncological clearance is ensured, 
with the data of limited esophageal involvement, proximal gastrectomy, likely results in better hemoglobin profile and weight gain and total gastrectomy, I think it's got a better quality of life. And the double track or the double flap reconstructions techniques, uh, I think are preferred over direct esophageal gastrostomy, in particular for a reflux esophagitis and quality of life uh, considerations. Uh, much of what I talk about, in fact, I, I've already summarized in this a paper that I wrote with Anuth Hosha. Uh, if you're interested, uh, just go to gastric cancer and get it. Uh, it's basically what I talk about in a little bit more detail. I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Simon. Yeah, thank, thank you, Professor Simon Law. Um, I think we'll call upon Mr. Kelvin to introduce the next speaker. Yep, sure. Right. Um, it's my pleasure again to introduce the next speaker, Professor Bing Kai Chow. Professor Chow is the uh, Chief of Thoracic Surgery Department from Taiwan um, Changgung Memorial Hospital. Um, he has a special interest, especially in robotic um, isophagectomy, besides the usual cardiothoracic uh, surgery that he has been doing. So um, he is actively involved in uh, clinical research and he has more than 100 publications under his belt. And he has also won numerous uh, awards, both locally and internationally. So um, I, 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 I need to do Professor Chow a favor today because his line is not very stable. So I'm going to play his um, presentation, which has been pre-recorded. Um, later on, Professor Chow will speak to us in person during the Q&A session. So just give me a minute. Hold on, let me share the video again. Hi, Kevin. There's no sound. All right, okay. For the video. Uh, all right, just go on then. Let me try this again. Sorry about that. Okay, let's do it again. My apologies. And now? thanks, Kelvin, for the invitation. And it's my great honor to be part of this wonderful meeting. And the topic I was assigned today is lymph node. Just before I continue, is can you hear the sound? Yep, okay. All right, I'm going to continue the presentation then. Apologies on that. The section in esophageal cancer, the optimal approach. So it's quite a big topic, and I will try to simplify my talk with several key concepts. So as for the lymph node dissection in the thoracic cavity, we can roughly this divided into three parts, the upper, middle, and lower. And for the definition, so we call the standard two-field dissection means removal of the lymph node in the middle and lower mediastinum. And for the total two-field dissection, we present the removal of lymph node uh, beyond the azygous arch, and which comprise the right and left recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes. 
So the first question we will answer is that who should receive uh, extended dissection and who should receive a standard dissection? So we, uh, we can divide it by these two parts. For the thoracic ESCC or the, or the junctional cancer, which could be either squamous cell or adenocarcinoma. So for the first part of thoracic ESCC, there is no doubt uh, for the upper medicinum is a very key station for lymph node metastasis. So for those who receive upfront surgery, this is a must do station for all thoracic ESCC. But how about after uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy? So this is our uh, data. So we routinely dissect all the lymph nodes in this area even after CCRT and in those with no evidence of lymph node metastasis. But however, we find that at least one fifth of the patient still have lymph node metastasis, even there is no radiological evidence of lymph node involvement. So in our uh, center, uh, the upper medicine of dissection is still necessary for all thoracic ESCC after neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. So, and how about a junctional cancer? This should be, could be squamous cell or adenal. So is it necessary to do upper lymph node dissection in junction cancer? So this is a very good uh, paper uh, published by the, our Japan colleagues. And they report the instance of lymph node metastasis, I mean, after routine uh, turtle to field dissection. And to simplify the concept, I used the uh, three symbols to represent uh, the likelihood of lymph node metastasis and the value of dissection. So for those with uh, red light, that means it is a must-do station. And for those with green light, means that uh, the rate of metastasis is less than 5%. Maybe we could skip this dissection. So first, uh, the overall lymph node metastasis rate in this three area in junctional cancer is roughly around 10%. And the lower part has high lymph node metastasis. So, and how about the type of histology? So we find that there is no difference in the uh, type of histology. So it doesn't change the uh, instance of lymph node metastasis. And how about the use of new adjuvant therapy versus upfront surgery? So interestingly, there is still no difference. But the most striking part is the length of esophageal invasion. So we can find that for those with uh, a longer esophageal invasion, which was mass uh, longer than four centimeters, the rate of upper lymph node dissection, uh, lymph node metastasis, is more than 15, uh, 14%, which means that it, the, in these patients, mm -hmm. this is a very important station uh, for lymph node dissection. So to conclude my first part of talk, so who should receive which kind of dissection? For the standard true field, I we recommend that for ECJ cancer with esophageal invasion less than four centimeters, you can just do standard true field. And for the others, which means that uh, all thoracic ESCC or junctional cancer with esophageal invasion more than four centimeters, you should go to the upper medicinum for total lymph node dissection. So in the next question is how, what's the optimal approach? So there, are, we all agree that a minimal invasive is the way to go. So there are two ways, by the vats or by the robot. So I'll show you some videos and let you decide by yourself. So the first part, uh, there are lower middle and upper. So I'll uh, talk step, stage, uh, uh, location by location. So in my opinion, the middle and the lower part of the uh, mediastinum, the lymph node dissection, maybe there is no difference when you do by robot or by vet. So, and the key concept in this area is try to divide the lymph node M blockly together with the esophagus. Uh, so which was uh, so-called mesoesophagus. And we should divide it all the meso uh, esophagus as close to the aortic uh, outer as possible. So it's like this. So there are a lot of uh, esophageal branches uh, from the outer and all the lymph nodes are located in, around this mesoesophagus area. It's like this. So, and this is the short video.
by robot. So we try to dissect as much mass of D2 in between the esophagus and outer as much as possible. And until we can see the control lateral median snow pure. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason mm -hmm. I'm uh, saying that the robot might be equally uh, effective as bats is that uh, this area, the dissection is not so complicated. And what you need is a good energy source. And uh, flexor tip is, might also be useful. So, and I'll show you a video about that. So this is another interesting video we performed when, when we use the Likashio hook. So which means that we don't need to switch the instrument. We can do uh, all the dissection by one instrument from the beginning to the end. And we can also preserve the, I mean, the hook, the, the superiority of hook, and also the good uh, sealing effect of the legacy device, the Maryland. Okay. And this one is very useful for doing the esophageal cancer surgery, especially over the middle and lower mediastinum. And normally after the dissection, uh, this part, this is the so-called mesoesophagus. esophagus. All the lymph nodes should be removed and blocked it together with the esophagus in this area, and the tumor remain un uh, untouched. So, and then we move them to the upper part. And the upper part, before we do the lymph node dissection, we have to do a very good, uh, I mean, esophageal mobilization uh, in the beginning. So there, this is the micro microscopic view uh, from of the upper mediastinum. We can see the esophagus <laughs> over here, and this is the thoracic duct, and this is the uh, esophagus vein. And the classical dissection, the M block concept, which uh, represent you should remove everything together with the thoracic duct and the esophagus. So this is the classical dissection layer. But nowadays we become more and more conservative. We try to preserve the thoracic duct if there is no evidence of uh, cancer involvement. So, and through the robotic view, you can see a very clear plan in between these two dissection layers. So I'll show you uh, some, some videos. And this is the way, the place we will start the dissection. And then the classical layer and the fashion dissection layer is in between here. So when you see the thoracic duct, if you want to do the classical layer, you should go beyond the thoracic duct. And if you go, uh, the modern layer is just uh, in between the esophagus and the thoracic duct. Okay, and this is the video. And you can, uh, for this part, I also see some benefits using the robot. And you can see very stable uh, camera uh, uh, view because everything was controlled by the surgeon. You control the right hand, left hand, and get camera as well as your right second hand. So you have, and you will see using the 10 times magnified endoscope view and 3D vision, you can see very uh, dedicated and uh, accurate precision dissection plane using a sharp dissection and cutting. Okay, and you can see the thoracic duct. We try to preserve it and we go uh, from the modern dissection layer instead of the uh, classical and block dissection. And we can use our both hand, the left hand and right hand for dissection and calculation. And during the vest, mostly the surgeon use only one hand for dissection and the left hand is majorly used for retraction only. And that's the difference. 
and we can see a very uh, uh, very uh, precise dissection plan, and we can control the energy. Uh, you just will do a very delicate dissection in this area. And I, this part is very important. If you want to do a very good upper medicinal dissection, you should first achieve a, a extensive dissection in this area. And mostly this is a vascular plan. There is only very small, small vessel. If you enter the good dissection, uh, the proper dissection layer, Okay, and after this part, we will start the major part. So the first one is the uh, right recurrent angio nerve lymph node. And there is another terminology called 2R station. So in my mind, this part, there's some benefit of a robot, but the benefit is uh, it's not that huge, but I, I can show you some videos. So the, and the tricks for do this is follow a stepwise approach. So you find the vagus nerve and then a subclavian artery, and then you will find the nerve. And there is always like this. So first we go from the vagus and then subclavian and find the right nerve and then do the lymph node dissection. So this video shows uh, how we do it by robot. So the vagus, <coughs> right recurrent nerve. So you can see in this area, I'm holding the camera. I'm holding, I'm using my right hand for cutting and left hand for dissection as well. And my right second hand is used for counter-traction of the lymph nodes. So there's no need for assistant in this area. And we can do a very proper dissection and using the wrist function of my instrument. And the uh, upper limit of dissection in this area is when you see the inferior cerebral artery, and that's the common adopted uh, proper dissection uh, limit. So and this is another video. And there is one lymph node uh, just near the right recurrent larger nerve, which is, is around this area. Okay, and this is another patient, more typical one. This is, this is before neoadjuvant, very bulky lip nodes. And after neoadjuvant, it is still bulky, but no more uptake. So the, the surgery view might be like this, but you can see still very steady view but the dissection is more difficult because of, because of a lot of adhesion. And we don't use a lot of energy device near the nerve. We use uh, just a hook and the cutting, try to minimize the laser thermal spread of my electro uh, coagulation uh, device. You see there's dense fibrosis and adhesion in between the lymph nodes and the nerve and the nerve was almost stuck uh, by the lymph nodes we can do a very good dissection. And still remove the lymph node and block the this. Okay. And then we'll move to the left uh, recurrent nerve lymph nodes. And this is called 2L, two, two 2L. L, two L. And in my mind, this area is the most benefit part we're doing by robot compared with bats. So in the tips of tricks that's very similar, follow the stepwise approach and do from the ventral to the dorsal side. And the key lymph node in this area is always located in the ventral side of the nerve. So we do a stepwise approach. So first we open the esophageal uh, trachea ligament, and then we do a flexible sus sus suspension 
by our third robotic, robotic arm, and then we take out the ventral side. And after this, uh, we try to preserve the sophagal branch of the nerve first mm -hmm. to do to achieve a tension-free suspension. And then after this, we re remove the dorsal side lymph nodes. So it's like this. So this, this is a four-step approach. So, and this is the short video. So, and this patient received chemoradiotherapy. And also, uh, if you want to do a good dissection, you can, you have to, uh, it's better to use the single lumen trachea intubation because it's easier for your uh, assistant to retract the trachea to do a better counter traction. But however, in this case, uh, we do the we use the double lumen because there's we find we find there might be some chance of to do the open surgery, but you can see there is much much this uh bit more difficult to uh to do the esophageal rotation by our system. But even though we can still do a good dissection by ourselves, so again, uh, the assistant is doing the retraction and we are holding uh our two arms the right arm and left arm, and also the suspension was performed by ourselves. And the first one is to do a very extensive lysis as close to the trachea as possible. And this is the proper dissection plan. And doing the VATS, sometimes it is very difficult to follow this plan of dissection because of the uh, instrument uh, angle and the rigidity. But by the robot, because of the end or risk function of your instrument. It's easier for us to do this. So after extensive lysis and then we try to identify the nerve. And the nerve is this this the nerve is always in the middle of this soft tissue, so-called mesoesophagus. And you as you can see, uh, the limb, the important limb, limb nodes are always located ventrally to the nerve. And when while we were doing the dissection, we never uh, grasped the nerve. We always use indirect traction contraction by this as what your branches uh, from the recurrent nerve. And we believe that this can minimize the 10, uh, I mean the stretch and tension to the nerve while you were doing the lymph node dissection in this area. And you may notice that when doing the dissection, I always use a very short activation uh, of my energy device because I try to minimize the thermal spread as much as possible. So I always use a very short fire, short fire instead of a long cutting. And in this area, there's always another nerve located ventrally to the recurrent nerve, and that is the cardiac branch of the sympathetic nerve. And we always try to not to injure the nerve in this nerve because. Uh, this nerve might cause some post-operative arrhythmia. Okay, this is the upper part of the dissection. After we ident we do a proper dissection along the ventral side, and now we move to the dorsal side. And for this part, there's still one small trick that we will first open the window in between the nerve and I mean, and uh, mesoesophagus. And after that, we put the guards in this window. And then we flip the esophagus by our assistant. And the nerve was protected by the guards. And we can do a quick and fast dissection to re remove all the nodes located dorsally to the recurrent nerve. And, as, and you can see the psoriasis duct is over there and we try to preserve and we do the dissection from the modern dissection layer. And there's another question, how high could you reach from the thoracic part? 
So we, when we do the next decision, uh, we we always first divide the esophagus in the thoracic part, and then we it will facilitate the removal of uh, esophagus from the neck. And this is what we can see from the neck view. So the, we already do a very high dissection up to the um, uh, larynx level from the thoracic part. And there is no need for us to do lymph node dissection in this area because we have already taken out by thoracic approach. And the only station we couldn't remove is the, uh, is the supraclavical lymph nodes, and that should be removed from the neck as well. So the final part is the subaortic area. And this area is, in my mind, is also better to perform by the robot. So this area is a short video, and the most fearsome part is the pulmonary artery. So this is, and I always do this as the final step of my procedure. And you can see this is the aortic arch is over here. And this is this is the recurrent nerve. And this is the recurrent part of the left recurrent nerve. And we can take out the lip nodes in this area. And, and always we use the uh, clipping instead of energy device to avoid the possible nerve injury in this area. So, and the question is that, are there any advantage for transition to robot by surgeon who are already proficiently performing that? So the answer, I, I don't know, but I think so, yes. But we, we should do some trials for some in those uh, who are already doing a lot of that. So this is our randomized trial and we compare the robotic surgery versus beds. And our primary endpoint is the efficacy and safety of upper and medial lymph node dissection. So and this is the recruit, uh, recruit progress. So, so far we've recruited more than 100 cases and we plan, we will finish the trial by the end of this year. And this is the uh, midterm result. And we find the, that robot is, has better performance in the upper medicine compared with beds. And this is a composite parameter, not only the pulse. So you can see the rate is higher, but I will show you the detailed data after we fin finalize all the trial. And thank you very much. And this concludes my today's talk and I will be very happy. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Zhao, for the excellent presentations. And I, I think that was a very nice video showing that how uh, he did the robotic um, esophagectomy with um, excellent right rec recurrent laryngeal lymph node dissection. So um, can I invite all the uh, speakers on board so that we can have some discussion here? And um, all the panelists, please try, uh, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, I'll start with the first questions that uh, from the audience to uh, Professor Tan. Um, what is your strategy of endotracheal intubation in prone and semi-prone position for patients undergoing MIE? Um, mm, actually, Tan? I have okay. answered the question. We use a single lumen mm -hmm. endotracheal tube, All right. as you uh, as you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Easy yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing that ever since I come back to Malaysia, and I, I must say that that was a very good technique. We don't have to do uh, with, with, um, with collapsing a lung, and we don't have to use a double lumen uh, tube intubation. Yeah. So Hans, you want to carry on with the next? Uh, yeah, you, in your presentation, you mentioned that during the anastomosis, you didn't... you preferred to do it hands-on rather than stapler. Was there any particular reason that you mentioned that? No, no, no. I just sat down by uh, another group from China, uh, Professor Li in Beijing. As uh, usually I use a stapler to do an osmosis. But you close the enterostomy. You do side, you use a linear stapler, but the enterostomy, you mentioned that you can either close by stapler or by uh, v lock like Prof. Simon does, but you mentioned in your present, you prefer to use the yeah. V lock. 
yes, I prefer VLOC to close the, the common orifice. Is there any particular reason why? Is it narrowing or leak? Uh, yeah, sometimes when you use stapler to close the uh, oral, or, uh, oral orifice, a common orifice, sometimes it will, if you uh, fire too much tissue, it will cause, uh, like cause the structure. So I think hand sewing is easy and, uh, and safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. We like it too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. This is to um, Professor Simon. Um, thanks for the excellent talk on proximal gastrectomies and, and the different ways of doing the reconstruction. Especially for proximal gastrectomy with double track reconstruction, do you think it's important for us to actually make the um, outflow of the ruling narrower? just distal to the GJ anastomosis so that the food will preferentially flow through the stomach to the duodenum and jejunum so it can actually reduce the chance of probably iron or calcium uh, or even B12 deficiency in this, this technique. Um, we, we don't deliberately uh, do mm -hmm. anything to uh, yeah. channel the food. Now, mm -hmm. oh, I show you the video that the contrast has yeah. gone through both limbs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Actually, honestly, I think it's slightly a little bit un unpredictable. It mm -hmm. also depends on where you do the uh, jejunal gastric anastomosis. Yeah. So uh, usually I just uh, cut the stomach. I open the stapled corner at the mm -hmm. lower end. And mm -hmm. I do this uh, side to well, end to side anastomosis. Uh, mm -hmm. But some people, they like to do the posterior or some like to do to the anterior yeah. wall. Yeah. I think if you do it on the body, they tend to go through the stomach a little bit better. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I think there is enough study to actually show um, the exact where or how the anastomosis uh, will change the food passage. So I, I don't really uh, do something deliberately to channel the food to go from one end to the other. Okay. What, what about using a narrow gastric tube um, in comparison to using just the remnant stomach to do a esophageal gastrostomy? Does, does it actually reduce the risk of reflux and esophagitis? Um, I don't think in the, when people do a transabdominal or transiatal resection, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think many people you use a very narrow stomach mm -hmm. uh, because mostly it's for each junction tumor. So you basically chop off the and you yep. use the distal part of the stomach. So mm -hmm. for a subject to me, I think Li Ji and uh, Yin Kai may comment, uh, yeah. There are some that show that the narrow, you do get less reflux. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Particularly, I think it's just the volume effect. Okay, thank you. Hans, you want to go on to the next question? Hi, Professor Yin Kai. Uh, two yeah. questions for you. Uh, mm -hmm. One one of the participants asked about what is your perspective in preserving the thoracic duct? Because I think even Professor Simon Law has mentioned in a few of his cases, he's found tumor embolus in the thoracic duct. That's the first question. Yeah. The second question is, uh, how many percent of your nodes are positive in upper middle third tumors with regards to left recurrent there in general? So, for, uh, so I'll answer the second question first. So the, for the, the right side is more common than the left side. So roughly in my case, I mean, after chemo radiotherapy, if you don't find, I mean, there's no evidence of lymph node by CT and PET, but if you do the dissection, you will find 11% of right side positive. I mean, that is unsuspected lymph node metastasis. And for the left side, it's around 9%. So that's, so in, according to the Japanese definition, maybe that's the uh, yellow light area that you can do it, or you can speak, skip it if you feel it is difficult. But for the right side, you have to do it. The right side is more common than the left side. And the dissection of right side is easier, yes, than left side. Yes, and for the second one is the thoracic duct, right? Uh, thoracic duct, yes, we will remove it and blockly when there is evidence of, I mean, tumor invasion into the thoracic duct. But uh, so, but nowadays, uh, because we can see the layer very clearly, so when there is very clear, clear uh, plan in between the thoracic duct and uh, the esophagus. 
I will tend to preserve it because I find if I rem uh, in, in cases I clipping the thoracic duct and uh, pure effusion will increase after surgery. Yes, but that is not a big problem. But I think it's better to to preserve it. That's my idea. And also in those with liver cirrhosis, I think uh, it is uh, when you try to clip the thoracic duct, you need to clip it very carefully because there is a lot of small branches. So sometimes when you clip the main, main, main duct, but you will still have chirothorax because there are some uh, reflux and also some minor ducts that are running in the mediastinum and will result in some chirothorax. So, and using the ICG, I mean, I tried several cases. If you put the ICG uh, from the inguinal lymph nodes before surgery, and you can light up the thoracic duct. And also I know Dr. Tan, he is using the milk. He will let the patient have some milk, maybe several hours before surgery. And during the surgery, you will see a very good demonstration of, I mean, the engorged thoracic duct. And you, it will minimize the duct injury, yes. Can I just make a comment about thoracic duct as well? Um, yep, I sure. think it's still a little bit controversial whether one should take out the thoracic duct or not. I think mm -hmm. the, uh, the best data that I could see was from uh, Harushi Udegawa mm -hmm. from uh, the Taranamo Hospital. Uh, he has published before and showing the incidence of nodal metastases along the thoracic duct sort of tissue. Um, and uh, basically for advanced tumors, things like T3 or T4, uh, I think he, his data showed that it's worth removing, but for very early cancers, it may not be worth uh, removing the thoracic duct. The other thing is about the uh, cirrhosis. I think the Japanese still have this idea that if patients have significant cirrhosis, then you should not remove the thoracic duct because it affects the hemodynamics of the patient. Uh, having said that, I think if the patients have significant cirrhosis, probably you have to think, think second, you know, second thoughts about doing a subjectomy because cirrhotic patients, they really do uniformly poorly uh, if you want to do a subjectomy on them. Thank you, it's very nice. Thanks. So, uh, Professor Chan, I saw that the thoracic duct was extremely engorged and juicy in your video. So, what, what was that uh, the, the effect of the ICG that you injected? No, no, no. That's the normal size of thoracic duct. <laughs> yes, yes. So, we yeah. haven't do anything for that thoracic duct. Yes, right, but right. for the ICG, it will be the same size. But when you turn okay. on the firefly or the ICG, right. it will be turned to green you know, or blue, something like that. Okay. Yeah. okay. So mm. si since we are talking about ICG, that there is a question actually on the use of ICG to evaluate gastric conduit perfusion while doing an esophagectomy. What is your thought on this? I mean, did this question is addressed to all three of you? So I'll, I'll yeah. Prof. I Chan, do can it. Yeah. I, yeah. I, Yes, I do it routinely. Yes, mm -hmm. but uh, sadly, I didn't reduce my leakage rate even if I used ICG. But mm -hmm. I may say maybe I can detect major ischemia by using the mm -hmm. ICG. That will. Mm -hmm. So maybe I got fewer gastri, I mean, the type 3 necrosis. Maybe the leakage I have only type 1 or type 2 leak, and this will right. heal eventually. Yes, okay. but ICG doesn't reduce my leakage rate, that's to be honestly, but I, I still use for every case, yes. What about? I, I, agree. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I think we use it routinely as well. The thing is, one, once you've used it, you know, you, you feel like you're not really doing it complete <laughs> uh, operation without it, because it, it just gives you such a good uh, image. Yeah. The problem about uh, still with the technology these days, it still relies on eyeballs. So, you know, you inject it, you look at it, and then you sort of interpret it yourself. Uh, there is no objective data. Uh, there isn't a magic number or the systems that are available now that you do mm -hmm. it, and then there's a number which will pop up and say, you know, this is not good, this is good. So uh, at the moment, it's still very subjective. Uh, I think the technology, ho hopefully the technology will improve and actually tell us uh, what is good and what is bad. Professor Tan, any, anything to add on the use of ICG? Uh, 
I have not lots of experience using uh, mm -hmm. ICG. Actually, we try to use another technology uh, in the past to to test the uh, blood the blood supply at the tip mm -hmm. of the of, of the uh, gastric tube. Uh, but also, we find it's not helpful to uh, to decrease our leakage rate, even the the the, the even the method tell us like we use a laser to uh, take the to to measure the blood supply at the tip of the gastric tube. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, and now we are uh, always do a very meticulous uh, mobilize mobilization of the gastric and mm -hmm. uh, just to make uh, a a slender uh, with a slim uh, slender gastro tube i find it's helpful to decrease the uh, leakage rate mm -hmm. uh, just uh, it's uh, easy to do and we don't use any uh, method to uh, and you 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 can see in your uh, fellowship term you can see yep. in, uh, the the leak, the gastric tube necros necrosis is very, very rare. Yeah. I didn't come yeah. across that. Even, uh, yeah, close to zero. So, yeah. <laughs> so we now don't use these, these uh, measurement to method to to to, mm -hmm. to test the, the blood supply. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, Maybe we we'll just yeah. take one last question yeah. uh, to Prof Simon and uh, Prof uh, Yin Chao. Um, Timing okay. of surgery mm -hmm. post neoadjuvant for minimally invasive as rejectomy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Simon first. Yeah. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So in my center, so we used the fifty uh four fifty. So and we tend to do surgery, uh, no more than twelve weeks, no more than twelve weeks, but normally. Uh, less than eight weeks, and we don't we don't see a lot of difficulty in dissection in that time period. But for the salvage surgery, sometimes it will be longer, and maybe that is recurrence after one or eight months, and that will be really a terrible uh, a, a disaster sometimes. But for new adjuvant, less than twelve weeks, I think is safe, and eight week eight week is better, I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Professor Simon, your experience? Uh, new adjuvant for esophageal cancer. Mostly we use the cross uh, and we reassess after four weeks with the PET CT and endoscopy and so on. And then we schedule the patient. So mostly they're operated in between say six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. okay. Prof Tan? Right. Yeah, you. we're the same. Hey. Same, uh, totally agree with Simon and uh, mm -hmm. Kai. Well, usually uh, six to eight weeks mm -hmm. uh, uh, no severe uh, cirrhosis and uh, i think it's uh, easy to do in this uh, period and for salvage sometimes uh, depends on the dosage of the radiation i think and the uh, uh, primary stage of the cancer if the cancer is like a, a T4A, T4B, sometimes you you will met a very uh, severe fibrosis mm -hmm. to the tracheal, to the uh, descending aorta, or anything else. You're still using a lot of cross over there in China. Yes, we usually use cross. Yeah, I, I guess in in the East Asia, the the SCC is the majority um, pathology for esophageal cancer. Um, I mean, for Malaysia, of course, we are seeing more and more adenocarcinoma due to obesity and reflux. But I guess in China, Japan, and um, um, in, even Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, you're seeing more of SCC still, right? All right. I think it, it was a great session, great night. Thank, I would say, um, it, I mean, although the initial hiccups that, but I thanks very much to Prof. Mahawa that solved the problem. We managed to get up to about 250 participants joining us tonight. Uh, we have total about 500 over registered participants. Uh, it's our great pressure to have you online tonight. And um, I guess we have to end here because it's already 9.40. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to all the speakers, Professor Tan, Professor Simon, Professor Yin Kai Chao, Prof Mahawa and Hans. Thanks for call sharing this session with me. And um, an, an announcement that we will send a survey form to you probably via the email. 
um, your feedback is very important to us for us to improve for the next session. And as the um, Tax Far East coordinator, I would like to announce that we will have this monthly. So tentatively on the 29th of May, the last Saturday of the month, we will have the second Tax uh, Far East Symposium on Gastric Cancer. So stay with us and uh, we will send out the invitation and announcement shortly, right? Thank you very much. Anyone, have a good night and have a great weekend. Thank you. See you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Calvin. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much.